Joel Lorenzi, Dirk Chatwin, the Half Court Press Podcast. Uh, welcome to another edition. It's uh, it's been a little bit. We had a uh, we had some issues uh, with availability, and uh, but things are heating up down the stretch. Before we get to Creighton and Nebraska, though, I know our dear listeners want to hear uh, the theme of the week, which is Joel versus the Blizzard. Uh, please do describe your difficulties in navigating this uh, this uh, Arctic hellscape known as Omaha, Nebraska, right now. Yeah, hey, you know what? I had some people mad at me in my mentions yesterday because I'm bringing up the snow. It's like, um, one, I'm from Chicago, so like. Um, people are like, I'm, I'm complaining about the snow and you know, I'm going to complain. Cause like, it, it, I feel like that comes with a writer. Like you just have, yeah, it's complaints. just, it's our personality. You yeah. know, we're always glass half empty. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still an optimistic guy, but the thing I didn't like, cause like in, Sh- in Chicago, I'm talking to my people today in Chicago and they're like, oh, the snow's already gone. And I'm like, well, what the hell? Cause I'm going down Dodge, the probably the busiest street in the city. And there's a lane today still that you can't use because there's snow, like on every inch and yesterday i was i was driving to uh campus and there was a lady that had like her car was like stuck in the middle of dodge like as you're headed downtown (laughs) and she's taking up like two lanes i'm like yo this is not normal how are people like okay with this like so so it hasn't been great and and and, and you had a little bit of mishap on dodge street too right yeah I, i i so i did spin out yesterday when i was headed home um so my car is like shaking today. I guess there's like snow buildup and tires, whatever. I don't have time to get the snow out, so I'm just waiting for it to melt, probably. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep shaking till then. But I, I feel like I could rightfully complain after that. I mean, I, I spun out in the middle of a, the you ended oncoming up in, traffic. You ended up in the other lane. Yes. In the, in the ongoing traffic. So I, I think some of the complaining is warranted. I mean, this uh, is not normal. Now, in our very brief conversation leading up to the podcast today, and I have a I have a philosophy that you should talk as little as possible leading into a podcast because a lot of times your best material is before you hit record. But uh, it did strike me that you had sort of a sort of a, uh, a kind of a you were given Omaha the small town, uh, you know, like get your stuff together, little city on the plains attitude mixed with. I can't drive in the snow because I don't have enough experience. And no, I, just, I, no, feel like, no, no. I feel like there's a contradiction there where you were kind of trying to hold over the, I'm from Chicago, <laughs> we have a lot of snow, we know how to get rid of our snow, uh, you little people need to figure out how to remove and clean off your streets, while at the same time admitting that you don't know how to drive in the snow. Not true. The, the only reason I even spun out was because... There was like a lane and a half the way I was going on Dodge and me and his other car were trying to. That's more than a half a lane of what you need. Just get in a single file line and travel down Dodge Street. Well, Just he, avoid the lane. The guy was side by side with me. So obviously you can imagine it was complicated. In Chicago, I don't have these problems because the snow be gone. And you know what? I, I have dealt with bad, bad. Uh, what, is there like a, is there like a melting force? Does the sun burn hotter in February in Chicago than it does here? You know what? How do you get rid of snow when it's 10 inches of snow? I wish I was a meteorologist to tell you how they do it but they just do it maybe they care more i don't know say, hey no shots but man i'm used to so my wife is from lincoln and i'm from a very small town and i have learned to deal with her little small town jabs i don't need them from you too coming from chicago okay? hey man, well you know you know they they were doing the same thing um when i was at mizzou like that they would basically they would cancel class because they knew like hey we weren't gonna clean up the streets like it just wasn't happening and so I didn't expect that to come from Omaha because really I, I I think of Omaha is like you know a relatively decent sized city like I'm thinking the snow was gonna be gone by today like instead it's piled up a long dodge I'm like yeah, what well, the hell Joel we haven't had much snow I mean it's been two years since we had a storm like that and uh, you know I I had to get the snowblower out yesterday it's it's basically been you know just clunking up the garage for the last two a years. A snowblower. How, how old were you when you bought a snowblower? Out in suburbia. Uh, 35, probably. Th- that's probably about the age you buy one. I'm yeah. not there well, yet. I'll tell uh, you what. When you have a winter with a couple big storms and you have one of those mornings where you feel like you can't move your back because you've been scooping snow, you, is you, that what it is? you start saving up money for a snowblower real fast. <laughs> how much does one of those even run you? I don't know. I don't remember too much for what I've gotten out of it. Too much. Well, I, I was fine yesterday. I, I shoveled the snow from around my car with the uh, one of those car the the snow brushes. So I thugged it out. Did you have a garage access or not? 
No. No. I don't pay for no garage, man. Ooh. Come on now. That's a tough morning not to pay for no, a garage. It was a tough morning, and I was running late, so yeah. But what can you do? Uh, well, we need to talk Creighton and Nebraska because uh, these seasons are have taken on a little bit different interest over the last two or three weeks. Yeah. Um, and I want to start with uh, I want to start with Creighton because the Jays. Um, I guess my big question, Joel, and, and I usually ask the questions <coughs> to you when it comes to Creighton. Is uh, are we going to look back on Valentine's Day evening as the night where Creighton lost the Big East championship? Um, I think it's too soon to say. Um, that's that's called you need to take a side. Do you not know the first take culture no, I, that we grow up in? You right, need right. to take a yeah, side. I don't, I don't. I don't think it will be. No, I think I think. Um, so if they lose it, it will be cu- it will be because there's another one coming. Yeah, I mean they could lose tomorrow. They could lose the game after that. They could lose at Villanova. Um, they're they're the the thing with Creighton is hurting Creighton is they got so many chances to lose. Um, they're probably the ones um, having the claw for that regular season title more than anyone because Marquette isn't playing no schedule like this. Um, Xavier isn't playing a schedule like this. Like you got to think they're mostly on the road. Um, they play at Carnesecca, which is obviously a headache. They play at Nova at, at Wells Fargo. Um, they just played at Providence, where they've lost one game in the past two years. And then their their home game um, is against Marquette, who's already beat them. Um, granted, that was a different team back then, but um, Marquette is easily in the driver's seat in the league right now. So this is no, this is nothing easy. I mean, they got to take it a game at a time, and really. Um, I think if they win out, uh, they still have a, they still probably can either share the title or win it. And so I don't think Providence is what it would feels do it. to me like. Win out, they get a share. Yeah. Um, now maybe that's too pessimistic. Maybe they win out and they they win it outright. But it feels like a share to me. I think it's just Marquette they're competing with really, and if that's what it comes down to. I don't think Providence is the deal breaker. Creighton's going to beat Marquette in Omaha. And, and if they're they, going to beat Marquette in Omaha. And if they do, you got to beat St. John's. Like you have to win the other yeah, games. I, I would be more worried as a Creighton fan. I would be more worried about the the road games against slightly lesser competition than I am the home game against Marquette. Which which you know it's in Omaha. It'll feel like a payback game. Creighton's full strength. Uh, the crowd will be electric. I mean, there's a lot of factors there that I think, you know, give me confidence that Creighton's going to win that game. It, it's it's as you mentioned. It's the will there be a slip up on the road? Yeah, and really, I mean, <laughs> there there are actually two mentions. And I was talking about this the other day with somebody, like whether the conversation should shift and their focus should shift because obviously you want to win a regular season title, but I think t- tournament wins are the bigger deal, right, uh, in the grand scheme of things, when you're talking about a coach's legacy and a team's legacy, what you do in the tournament. There's a little bit that. of a been there, done that feel with the Big East Championship. Uh, yeah. I, I always think the conference title regular season is is a huge deal. And yeah, b- and it's big, important. And Don't bigger than winning an additional game. And if you could say, okay, you're going to finish second in the Big East and go to the second round of the NCAA tournament, or you can win the Big East and lose in the first round of the NCAs. Give me the Big East championship because I think that you know you hang a banner for that. I mean that's a big deal. I don't think either is ideal. You don't want to you don't want to get upset in the saying, first round I'm after just winning. Giving you, I'm just giving you hypothetical scenarios. Those here. are each bad hypotheticals. Okay, fine. I, I think they would want to finish top two, top three, and end up in the Elite Eight or something, man. Like that that should be the goal. Like they should be planning ahead for. Okay, let me give you a scenario. They can win the Big East championship. And lose in the Sweet 16. That's that's a good deal. Or they can finish second in the Big East and go to the Elite Eight. I think that's a bigger deal, if I'm being honest. Elite Eight, second yeah. in the Big East? Because I think people are already putting putting the hypothetical in the current situation we're in. Like I think people already think that you know it's an uphill battle for Creighton the rest of the way. Like They're going to have to win out. Um, so I think... If they end up dead placing second, which is probably most people's expectations by now, and they end up in an Elite Eight, people would be overjoyed. I mean, Sweet 16 is what they've uh, hung their hat on, so Elite I, Eight would be. I still like hanging a banner, Joel. St- and granted, they'll hang a banner I for the Elite you. Eight, too. I hear you. So, yeah. Uh, my next question you know, they got a lot of guys that are playing well. 
they got a lot of guys who are playing intense basketball and have been for a while now. Is yeah. there any fear that this team sort of wears out on about March 10th? Um, I think some of that will be answered tomorrow. I think looking at how they look tomorrow after guys played damn near 50 minutes um, will tell you whether it'll really wear down. Because it's not like, like, dude, like they these dudes have been playing. We talk about it often. These dudes have been playing Tom Thibodeau minutes all season. Like, <laughs> this is not – this ain't nothing new. And so, um, really, that was the furthest they were pushed was the other night. And so, um, I think these stars are built for it. I mean, they've, they've had to be to be able to uh, go so long. And so, um, tomorrow will tell you a lot about where they stand during that month of March. and Because, you know, those games are more spread out. And so, you got – um, I don't want to say t- Wait, time to rest. the March games are more spread out? Yeah, I mean, if you go further. No, you're playing two or three consecutive in New York, and then you get four days off before you right. go play two more in the NCAA tournament. But the NCAA, the thing, the thing I, I'd say is Maui, they played back-to-back-to-back games. They did. And yeah. they were fine then. And so when I think you look at the first well, weekend. they were fine of, until they lost the next six games. Yeah, but I don't think it was because of that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's uh, it's it's going to be a really interesting stretch. And I think everybody, based on where Creighton was a month ago, I think everybody's just sort of excited to see them play high stakes basketball, right? Because it's like this is what this is where essentially where they were supposed to be. Yeah. At the start of the year, granted, they're probably a seed line below two or you know one or two seed lines below where we thought they would be. At the start of the year? Probably a few, really. Yeah, two or three, okay. But but the point is, like, there's an old cliche that reminds me of Bill Callahan, and, you know, our goals are still in front of us, right? And with Creighton, the goals are still in front of them. Like, nobody cares about losing six games in December, right? This is all about, yeah. you know, can you win a Big East championship? Can you, can you make a run in the NCAA tournament? And that stuff's still in front of them. Yeah. And realistically, people cared so much because it was Nebraska. It was um, a couple of very, very avoidable losses to yeah. BYU and Arizona State. So the losses hurt. Like, even looking back at UConn at the start of um, conference play, like, it's not the losses. It wasn't that loss. Like, the UConn, because that, obviously that was a very high tension. I felt like turning point in the season was UConn. Um, and it wasn't that they lost to UConn. It was the way they lost to UConn because it, it was similar facets to how they had lost some of those games earlier in the year. And um, obviously those early games were to teams like Nebraska. Hey, uh, this isn't a shot at Nebraska. Nebraska's gotten some really good wins since then. But um, obviously for the kind of team that Creighton was being propped up as and the expectations they had, um, it was a blemish, man, because these two teams had far different expectations. And um, you look at now and it feels like that run, even though you don't, as a team, you don't want to lose games. I mean, you probably have to to learn some lessons, but six in a row is outrageous, but it feels necessary now. Yeah. Well, I look at the minutes the other night, Joel. I mean, <laughs> Creighton had it's crazy. 47 minutes, 45 minutes, 49 minutes, 47 minutes, 47 minutes. That's, and, that's and the you know, starting Kalkbrenner, lineup. Kalkbrenner only played 45 because he had foul trouble. And the sixth guy played seven minutes. That's that's this team, man. I'm not sure that's healthy. I'm and, not sure that's a good thing. And you know, if Farabello was playing, he probably would have played 20, 10, 15, yeah. you know. But th- this is what this team has been built on, man. Um, they, but is that responsible for why you only scored two points in double overtime? I think it's part of it. Um, and then part of it is it, some of it, you know, you do get gas, but then the shot making turns off at a certain point. You – to bring that team that has lost one game in that building over the past few years to that point, um, the shot making that got you there, everything that got you there, and you had chances to knock them off beforehand before your shot making fell off. Like, that's just basketball is variance, man. And soon enough, between being gassed and just the shots not falling for you anymore, it's going to run. Your luck is going to run out. And they had they had their chances. Like, we, I wrote about this. Like, they had at the end of regulation the, the tip that somehow – it looked like a great opportunity. Um, they had opportunities in, in the first overtime, and then in the second overtime, it was like no chance. I wish the Big East was a little bit better at the top, okay? It's not perfect. And I wish the bottom was 
better. The top five is really good. Well, but I'm saying, like, I'm not sure there's a national championship contender in that group. Would you disagree? I mean, people would see Creighton that way. I think Marquette is going to go further than people think. Marquette is a really good team. Not but, Maybe not championship type. I was going to say, let's just, if there's, if there's five to ten you know, real national championship contenders, and there might be more this year. I'm not sure the Big East has one of them. That's my point. But well, maybe we should shift it to Final Four contenders. I think there are maybe a few. Well, that opens up things a lot. Yeah. Uh, but where I was going with that is, this is an old school league this year. Like the home court advantage, you know, the crowds, like it's excessive. Yeah. The it's just a really freaking fun league to watch, and it, it reminds me. I don't want to say it reminds me of the old Big East, but it it reminds me of like kind of an old school basketball league. Well, Chattel the, said that much. Yeah, uh, and, and he did. Yeah, I mean, I really liked Tom's column last week about, you know, sort of the stop saying it's the new Big East, it's just the Big East, which is a great theme. Yeah. Um, but it, even more than that, it just reminds me of, of sort of old school college basketball. Um, when you walked into an arena and you knew that it was going to be, you know, a crazy atmosphere and you knew that it was going to be really hard to win. Uh, I think it's really cool that all these teams have, are, have stayed perfect at home. Yeah, I agree. And it, it, it's unreal. The, like we're talking about, a, I mean, in the big 10, they're like slaughtering each other. Right. And it doesn't matter where you're playing. Like teams are going down. And initially, like you mentioned it for teams to be perfect at home. Like it's unreal. Like the, the pressure to try to go into someone else's building and, and win a game. I mean, the the record for Providence alone in the past few years is daunting. So for that to be spread out to the top of the conference, uh, I think it it's it's added spice to this league race. Um, and John Fanta said it a, quite a few times that I'm I'm probably close to agreeing that this is um, the most competitive league title race probably since the the new Big East was formed. Well, Villanova was so dominant for so long that, yeah. you know, even when the Big East was good, they were generally the best team. Um, you know, you had a couple of years in there. Where Villanova, Seton Hall, Creighton a couple of years ago where it was it was neck and neck. But the depth at the top distinguishes it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what I, what I will add to, you know, the top four teams competing for the league title, UConn is as – Strange of a nobody wants to see them in New York, right? Right, and uh, Villanova they got Justin Moore back at the perfect time. They're a different team now. A uh, Seton Hall can beat any team on any given night for whatever reason. So like, um, this league is is not filled with pushovers. You anymore. really are starting to sound like a coach. It's becoming a little bit obnoxious. Like the what coach, do you mean? Speak, the coach speak is creeping into your vocabulary. Like you know. It's a tough place to win. Everybody's, you know, you got to bring it every night. It's like you're too, <laughs> you're too young to be talking like this. Well, well, la- true. Last thought on the NCAA tournament for me, which is I think it's going to be shocking this year how the, the minute differences between, like, the three seeds and the six seeds yeah. or the seven seeds or whatever. You know, like, there's just, there's just a glut of pretty good teams, but – Teams that are extraordinarily flawed, um, and you know we can say that. Well, it's like that every year, but this is a little no, bit of a strange year. This year. I mean, if if Gonzaga ends up a three seed and Creighton ends up a six seed, like who would you rather have? Yeah, Creighton's going to be a very very trendy, like five six. And I seed wonder if that's going pick. against them. I wonder if that works against them, man. They're going to be like picking them so seriously much. every every bracketologist out there not bracketologist every bracket analyst on espn and fox you know is gonna is gonna have creighton going farther than their seed um and you're right i think that puts that'll put a little bit of unusual pressure on them yeah but it but it it won't be like okay like some picks are genuinely hipster picks but this won't be the craziest pick right because they have to be fifth or sixth Seated because they lost six games straight. Like it's been incredibly and the, and hard the to defend. Has it. to, they have to recognize that. Like you can't just say, "Well, Cock Brenner was out." You know, we're not going to count those. Like they still yeah. count. So I think Creighton's going to get punished for those. But it's pretty clear they're not the same team they were in December. Okay, let's hit the Huskers because Joel, I thought 
Fred Hoiberg was going down like the Titanic. You had a tweet the other day that made me laugh saying that. Give him a lifetime contract. But it was what came before that. You said, as I've been saying. <laughs> as I've said, yes, a thousand times, give Fred Hoiberg a lifetime contract. Uh, as as the guy who, my relationship with Fred Hoiberg has been uh, topsy-turvy to say the least. I used to be his absolute number one fan. I thought he was you know, the next Steve Kerr who was going to win an NBA championship. Uh, and then a year ago, I was bound and determined he was going to get fired and should be fired. And now it's like he's playing a completely different style. They're still not very talented, uh, but, man, they are maximizing what they have. They went into Rutgers, and they spanked Rutgers the other night. It's um, it's unbelievable what they've been able to do, not just dating back to Creighton, but looking at two of their rotation guys being out for the year. The fact that they're still winning big games is otherworldly i mean it, he's it, playing his walk-on son in crunch time yeah, like and it's it's a cool story and it, and it's and it's yeah you're right it, you took the word out of my mouth it's a cool story it's been fun i, I saw the interaction case they had with with steph on yeah Twitter. how cool like, is that that's just unbelievable man yeah and they they actually have a chance to well i mean they play they play three home games you know the next 10 days um 12 days and you know then they ended iowa but if uh, if they get a good crowd, you know, and they play with energy and intensity and confidence, and Casey's knocking down jump shots, like there's no reason they can't beat Maryland and Michigan State in in Pinnacle Bank Arena. This, as crazy as it sounds, this team has an outside chance at making the NIT, and there's no way we would have said that, you know, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, uh, after after Gary and Banamel got hurt. So uh, it's. It's got to be a little bit weird as a Chicago guy watching Fred Hoiberg play this, you know, play play uh, with not only a different style this year, but also just kind of like making the most of what he's got because that's not really what he was known for. Yeah, and it's been interesting to see the adjustments he's made. Not just – it wasn't just one adjustment, right? Like at first this team became a nasty, ugly win defensive team and you lose two of your better defenders and – and now you're still maximizing your talent. It's, it's been crazy to watch. What I, what I am worried about with Horberg, because by now, um, we were saying this after, like, the Iowa win, but, like, by now, he's, he's probably at least bought himself another year, right? I think so, yeah. So the, the thing we have to look at then is, you know, how attractive a place does Nebraska become? Who can he land in the portal? Because some of your better players will not be here next mm-hmm. year. And so um, – the foundation of what you've been able to do, you're going to have to rebuild it and restart once more, and um, that's always a challenge for, for any coach. But, man, it's it's a lot easier to make that sales pitch, I think, when, you're, when you've had a good close to the season. You know, What and, I wonder they, is if kids care about that. Well, maybe not, but I think internally it's a good thing for morale. I think it helps guys want to stick around. Um, you know, we'll see what some of those guys on the roster want to do. They'll have, they'll have opportunities. I mean, Tominaga is going to be, if he keeps this up another month, like people are going to know who Casey Tominaga is. And you know, I, I, as I'm reading the interaction and I saw the the feature, I think Big Ten Network did on him. I'm thinking, is this is this dude like? Could somebody pluck him in a portal? Like, is he getting bigger than Nebraska now? Like. I, that was the thought. That popped a year in my ago, head. I thought he should have been at Nebraska Wesleyan uh, or <laughs> UNO, and now he's, you know, Sam and I argued about it a week ago. Like, is this is this a is he a bona fide Big Ten starter? And it's you can't argue that he's not right now. I mean the the shooting the shooting versatility, um, shot the, making the the shot making, um. And the shot diet, bro. Like, this is a dude you could plug anywhere. Like, who doesn't want shooting? And the way he shoots it, at the rate he shoots it. Um, it's just at the college level, like, um, it's something every program could use. I don't care if you were the nastiest winning, ugliest elbow at everybody, uh, never never hardly shoot outside at all. It, every team could use a dude like Casey with the way he's shooting it right now, I think. Last four games, 30 points, 24, 22, 22. And the three-point shooting, 5 for 10, 4 for 8, 5 for 11, 4 for 9. Like this absurd volume. He's, shoot, he's shooting high volume, 50% three points from three-point range. Uh, he's, he's a real piece. And, uh, 
you know, they it, it, it allows other guys to not have to do as much, too. Like, Greasel doesn't have to do as much. You know, Walker doesn't have to do as much. Um, it's just been fun. I mean, Fred's been through a lot the last three and a half years, most of it his own making. Uh, but it's really fun to see him smile after a game, you know, because – Joel, you missed some rough times, you know, the last few years here. Yeah, it was sure. uh, it, there was some bad, bad months in Lincoln, and uh, they've kind of come out of it. Yeah, it, it, it seems so. And um, I wonder what the mood will be headed into the summer. I mean, obviously we got to see how these final few games go. Beating Maryland doesn't seem crazy. They did just beat Purdue. I think that helps Nebraska beat Maryland. Yeah. I really do. I think there's likely to be a. A hangover there that that actually helps Nebraska. Think so. Yeah, we got, we got to talk about Purdue too because I've been I've been whispering this kind of behind closed doors, but I thought because I've seen Creighton paired with different number one seeds in certain brackets, and I thought of the number one seeds, Purdue, because people were probably obviously they're going to be probably the number one overall seed. Well, maybe I, maybe not anymore. Maybe not anymore. You know, I thought they were probably one of the more beatable elite teams, if they have, if they are even elite, um, because of the drop off from Edie and um, you see in their guard players like kind of faltering in in late games. And it'd be fun to see Cockbrenner versus Edie, wouldn't it? it? I I think Creighton, I think Creighton will win that matchup, man. That's all I'm saying. I I I think uh, who they wouldn't want to see is probably Houston. Oh, Houston, just Agreed. a different animal. In March. Alabama, Alabama, but like Purdue, I th- I thought before, and people will bring out the receipts for me. I thought Purdue was gonna fall eventually. I mean, it was just <laughs> Edie is the best player in college basketball, but after him, the roster the roster's built around him, and they've had guys showing courage and flashes, and who will probably have promising careers. But right now, there's just a drop off that will be hard to win six games in a row in March, I think. Joel, how about this? This is the Big Ten standings, okay? Minnesota sucks. Ohio State sucks. Chris yeah. Holtman's probably going to get fired. Probably. Um, Purdue's obviously still number one. Northwestern is second. What a story, huh? <laughs> at, They've been wild. At 10-5. and five. Third place is 9-6. and six. If we're just looking at loss column, because a few of these teams have different different number of games, Indiana's in third place with six losses. Wisconsin is in ninth place, tenth place with eight losses. The yeah. difference between third to eight to ten is is two losses, uh, and it's just reflective of college basketball this year. You know, especially especially the Power Five leagues, um, they're just a jumbled mess. And I think the Big Ten might be the the best illustration of that. Yeah, the Big Ten is easily the most jumbled mess. Um, it's just <laughs> it's a slaughterhouse, man. They kill each other every night. I mean, the Big Twelve's like that too, though. No, the big no, you're you're right. But the Big Twelve, the Big Twelve is actually elite teams. Like, yeah, they are. Like I'm not gonna say oh the Big Ten don't got elite teams, but the Big Ten, you see what happens to the Big Ten in the tournament every year. The Big Twelve, I feel like I'm probably jinxing the Big Twelve now in, in the tournament, but the Big Twelve, that's the best conference in basketball by far. Teams are gonna lose in that conference. I mean, TCU, I don't know TCU's record, but um, they were um, lower on people's radars to start the year for whatever reason and now they've come around like it's just i mean texas tech which was a really good win for creighton back then they absolutely are shitting the bed in that conference like yeah. it's just that good the big 10 strikes me as a league that's gonna get you know nine teams in and by the end of the first weekend they'll have two teams left you know it just feels like one of those years that's you know what's crazy what what year was that i was covering back when i was covering mizzou um this is the tournament they had in Indy, like the bubble tournament where everybody was like in the vicinity of right. Indianapolis. Um, the Jalen Suggs year. Yeah, that was the, the year. Half court shot. So I'm, I, I think I what game did I go to cover? Well, yeah, I was only covering Mizzou at the time, so I went to cover Mizzou. But um, you just saw floods. Like I was trying to keep up with the stuff on my phone that day, and I was I was walking around Indy. I, this was actually the day before I was doing an on the ground story, and so I was walking around downtown Indy. And, you know, these 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 fans come in packs, man, like all one color. Like if you a Tennessee fan, you'll see a sea of orange. It was just the the, the seas from Big Ten schools were super depressing that first weekend. Like <laughs> I think Ohio State got upset that, that first weekend. Um, 
Illinois. I don't remember if Illinois got upset the first game. might have been the second game. That might have been the Loyola year. And, Joel, my theory on the Big Ten struggles is that they're too interior-oriented. You think so? Yes. Uh, I don't think, generally speaking, the guard play in the Big Ten is as good as it is elsewhere. Uh, and I think that's why they struggle in March. So we'll see if I'm wrong this year. You're probably right about the, the guard play part. Um, but the big part, I mean, teams win with good big all the time. North Carolina got there with a with a good big last year. Kansas, Kansas David McCormick wasn't the best big, but he, he, he was pretty was, good in Kansas the tournament. Kansas was good everywhere last year. No, they were, yeah. So that's why I agree with the point about the guard play. Cause it, it, but if you go down, look at, you know, historically, look at the number of Big Ten teams where their best player – is a four or a five, okay? And compare that to other leagues. And I think, typically speaking, the Big Ten is more post-dominant. Yeah, the Big Ten's best faces are post players right and now. And I just think that's not what March basketball is. You know, March basketball is shot clocks down to seven. You know, uh, our, our point guard or two guards got to make a play off a ball screen. And yeah. I think the Big Ten struggles with that. No, I'd agree. Um, yeah, you're probably right. That's why I think... Like, when, when people keep asking me, oh, like, because, you know, I've been a fan of Houston all year and for a few years now. And um, they play in the AAC, so people are going to say whatever. But um, I look at teams in terms of the guard play and uh, just wings in general. Like, who's going to have playmakers and the shot clock? Like, playmakers, like, they do, man. Them, Alabama, like, I think those teams would crush a team like Purdue in, in the tournament. Agree. Really. Agree. Okay, that wraps up the Half Court Press podcast. Uh, this pod will look a little bit different going forward. Uh, Joel's still going to be the star of the show. He's, uh, he's doing a great job on the Creighton beat and, and will continue to do so. So we are uh, thankful for our audience and uh, glad you tune in. Joel, I look forward to, to maybe getting a chance to work with you again down the line. Yeah, likewise. All right, man. Take care. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>